Herkland, ja. Laria is here. Yes, it was. And do we already tested the uh, screen share microphone okay. and camera? Okay, great. I, I waiting. I was in the waiting room actually. Oh, okay. Hello, good morning. Hello, Claudia. Hello, Ilaria. Really great pleasure to have you here today. Thank it, you. Yeah, it has been really nice. Good. How's the conference going? Uh, smoothly. We had uh, a number of problems before running it, actually, and uh, because uh, arranging the conference uh, in, in China is not uh, that easy. There are a lot of restrictions also from the technical side, but in the end, we managed to solve all of them. And the conference has been done, has been uh, quite smooth. Uh, no complaints from the, the, the attendees. So th that's the good sign. We are live. <laughs> we are live. Okay. So anyway, you were saying that we solve all the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, by the way, we uh, we also. Uh, uh, gave uh, some uh, mot motivation for some technical choices also on the on the channel. Um, before we start, I would like to ask you if it is fine for you uh, if uh, when you finish the talk, uh, you send us the slide and we, we, we will put the slide available on the website. Additionally, you will be also broadcasting uh, both in China and uh, via YouTube besides of uh, um, the um, being available for the conference participant. So is that yeah. fine for you to, to provide the slides? It is, I just need to find out if I, because I am on leave at the moment, I'm on leave as you know, mm -hmm. I need to find out if I can leave the university logo in there or not. So give me a few days and I will find out, okay? That would be fine, yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. IBM Research is home to 3,000 scientists and researchers around the globe who deeply believe in the power of the scientific method to invent what's next for our company, for our clients, and for society. It would be impossible to tell the story of computing without IBM, and it would be equally impossible to understand the next computing revolution without the technologies that IBM Research is now pioneering. Um, I cannot share my screen at the moment. Uh, yeah, because I'm sharing it right now. Uh, when I will stop, you will be able to. So I can't share it. You haven't unlocked me yet. Uh, I give you the rights, but right now I'm sharing it. Uh, when oh, I okay. Stop I just it, thought I that it wasn't working. That's fine. No problem. Okay. What does the future hold for our health? Longer lives, more clinicians, high quality care. The power to help clinicians benefit from all the research data in the world. The power to take on the infodemic with trusted information and help millions of students become practice-ready professionals. We believe that knowledge has the power to shine a light into the darkness.
IBM Research is home to 3,000 scientists and researchers around the globe who deeply believe in the power of the scientific method to invent what's next for our company, for our clients, and for society. It would be impossible to tell the story of computing without IBM, and it would be equally impossible to understand the next computing revolution without the technologies that IBM Research is now pioneering. What does the future hold for our health? Longer lives, more clinicians, high quality care. The power to help clinicians benefit from all the research data in the world. The power to take on the infodemic with trusted information and help millions of students become practice ready professionals. We believe that knowledge has the power to shine a light into the darkness. IBM Research is home to 3,000 scientists and researchers around the globe who deeply believe in the power of the scientific method to invent what's next for our company, for our clients, and for society. It would be impossible to tell the story of computing without IBM, and it would be equally impossible to understand the next computing revolution without the technologies that IBM Research is now pioneering. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. It's a great honor for me to introduce Ilaria Capua to you today. Ilaria Capua is a full professor and director of the One Health Center of Excellence at the University of Florida which focusing, focuses on co-advancing uh, co health as an integrating system through an interdisciplinary approach. She has worked in uh, veterinary virology for over 30 years, directing uh, international laboratories in the study of viral infections transmitted from animal to humans, as well as their pandemic potential. Visionary by nature, she pioneered genetic data sharing to improve pandemic preparedness. Indeed, in 2006, when confronted with the threat of an avian influenza pandemic, she challenged the existing system with the decision to share the virus genetic sequence on a free open access digital platform, rather than following the official protocol, contribute the data to a password protective database accessible only to a small number of researchers. This action has been pivotal in redefining the politics of transparency between international organizations in order to optimize strategies for confronting global trade, including pandemics. Along her career, she has received an incredible number of honors and awards. Here, I'm going to cite just a few of them. 
such as uh, the Scientific American 50 Awards uh, by the Scientific American Magazine in 2007, the excellent award awarded by the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infection Disease in 2014, and the, ve the very recent Ipaxia Prize from the Academia Europea of Science in 2021. She is also a member of the European Academy of Science. She is author of more than 200 publications in peer reviewed journal, and she has also published scientific books. Uh, besides that, she is also author for books uh, for the general public, in including children and teenagers. Today, Ilaria Capua will present her current research focusing on circular alert, which is a novel, broader approach to health, which aims to advance the health of humans, animals, plants, and the environment by addressing the health as a system. Many thanks, Ilaria, for being here. The SAS is yours. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the organizers of this meeting. I would just um, like to make sure that you hear me well. Um, if somebody could... Yes, uh, we can hear you. That's good. Okay. Um, and uh, yes, it is uh, an honor for me to be here. I am a scientist. Uh, I am a virologist. I have spent most of my life working with uh, viruses and pre-pandemic viruses, so viruses before they cause a pandemic. And so um, I would like to share with you some views that um, try to integrate uh, some of the awarenesses that we have now because of COVID-19 and some of the tools that we have now to address uh, major problems like uh, a pandemic, a worldwide event, uh, in a different way. So um, I would like to share my slides. Uh, can you see them? No. Ah, there. Can you see them? Is this good? Yes, still not in presentation mode. Okay, good, good. So as I said, um, my, my challenge today for, for us as a community, as a scientific community, um, is to uh, see uh, what opportunities lie out there um, to do a better job with understanding the very, very complex dynamics we have around health issues, particularly during um, a pandemic and as a result of the pandemic, but not ignoring other things that are happening around us and that we must absolutely address. And of course, we are all aware that um, we do have a 2030 agenda, which is uh, the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, which uh, has been developed over the years and has been endorsed by many, many countries who have agreed to move forward this agenda. And I will try and tie a few things together to see if we can develop a, a new roadmap which optimizes what we have in terms of information, in terms of awareness, in terms of knowledge, and of course, in terms of uh, a roadmap to, um, to, to get there. So um, let me start with this, which um, I think <laughs> is uh, absolutely true. And um, I would say is a pillar statement for my talk. Uh, and basically, it, uh, it means that we have an enormous amount of data, most of which is uh, inoperable, most of which does not talk to each other, most of which is completely new, um, that make COVID-19 the most measured event in history. And so, if you could keep this in mind, I will try to lead you to through a thought trail, um, 
which uses this statement as one of the main pillars. But before I do that, um, I, I, I just would like to share with you the concept that because it is the most measured event in history, it is a transformational event because suddenly we have an amount of information which was totally unthinkable of before the pandemic hit. And transformational events require transformational solutions. And so I like to compare <laughs> the opportunity we have um, with high jumping. So um, until a certain time in history, uh, high jumping was done in this way. Uh, it was uh, a sport which was done uh, by um, jumping over the bar, facing downwards. And um, this is what high jumpers used to look like. And of course, because of the dynamics of that jump, uh, a maximum height was reached and it seemed that homo sapiens, human beings, athletes could not go and could not jump any higher than this. Until somebody came along, Mr. Fosbury, who completely revolutionized high jump uh, and started jumping instead than from the front and facing down, he started jumping backwards. And by jumping backwards, um, he actually broke and broke and broke existing world, rec world records and transformed completely high jump. So I would like you to keep your mind open and think of this as a metaphor for what we are trying to do. We are trying to uh, develop a new paradigm about around health, which requires a completely different approach. So going back to pandemics, which are of course the, my main focus, uh, or at least they have been for a very long time, uh, pandemics happen. They happen every so many number of years. They happen on a regular basis and they transform society. Most pandemics transform society. Um, and COVID-19, of course, is one of these pandemics that transforms society. And when you have an event that transforms society, it is clear that there will be a before and an after. So I'm sure that in the common way of, of expressing yourselves, you will say, oh, I haven't seen that person since before the pandemic, or I decided to buy a house after, it happened after the pandemic, or rather I decided to move into a house with a balcony because, uh, and it was after the pandemic. So the pandemic is actually separates our lives into a before and an after. In addition, uh, pandemics uh, shake systems. And, um, and what happens to these systems is that uh, some of them uh, collapse. Uh, some of them are reinforced. But generally speaking, um, the pervasiveness of a pandemic event um, affects many, many systems, which you would have never thought could be influenced by uh, uh, a microbe. And because we call ourselves homo sapiens, it's not anyone else who calls us homo sapiens. It's not the dogs that call us homo sapiens. It's not the birds, but it's homo sapiens that call our species homo sapiens. Therefore, uh, sapiens means knowledgeable. Um, as a species, uh, we have, I think, the responsibility to learn from this event to try and put as much information together as we can and to move on and to move on and be in a better place. However, um, it's not only the pandemic, which is the problem just now. Um, we have uh, many other things that are happening at the same time. Some of them are caused by the pandemic. Some of them 
um, are, let's say, mildly related to the pandemic. Some of them are considered unrelated, but certainly there's a lot going on. And apart from the worldwide spread of a virus, which is something that I'm sure many of you would have never expected, of course, virologists like myself and other people working with pre-pandemic viruses, we knew this was going to happen. Um, but I'm sure that a, a lot of you didn't see this coming. We can also say that um, the pandemic has, of course, shaken and put under a lot of stress health systems. You will remember the building of hospitals in uh, record time in, uh, in China, which was certainly uh, something which the West looked at um, with surprise, but, but actually should have uh, understood the severity of what was happening when um, this very fast building of um, infrastructure occurred. But also, you will know that this is um, the hottest year ever since uh, Homo sapiens started measuring temperature uh, of the planet. We, we know that um, 2022 is by far the, the year in which the temperatures recorded were higher. And of course, this uh, rise in temperature uh, causes a series of effects that are related to um, the temperature balance of the planet. And we are seeing floods um, in many, many places in Europe. We are seeing droughts to the point that um, uh, they are rationing water in some parts of the world, which traditionally instead had rather stable um, sources of fresh water. Also, one of the things that we are we have realized and that we have suddenly become aware of is the uh, food crisis. So, of course, the war that is going on has put an accent on the availability of wheat for certain parts of the world that are completely dependent from uh, wheat. But also, we know that the planet is increasing in numbers of people and that we will need more food to feed um, the people of the world. And so um, as COVID is happening, um, we, have, we are aware that there are other things that need to be addressed. And if you think of these other things, these things actually are also related with our health because extreme weather events are related with our health. The availability of fresh and sanitized water is influences our health and the availability of um, a relevant or uh, necessary amounts of food and of healthy food uh, is also uh, essential for our health. And so we have all of this going on. And I would like you to keep this in your mind um, because I will uh, pick some up some of these issues um, later on. But the first thing I want to start with is saying that uh, pandemics are caused by pathogens, which often have, uh, very often actually, have an animal reservoir or a viral ancestor in animals. And if we learn from history, because if you don't learn from history, you live it again and <laughs> history repeats itself. Um, we know that, for example, Black Death, which uh, decimated between 25 and 50 million people in, um, in uh, mainly in, in some parts of Europe, um, is truly something that in those days, because there were not as many people as there are now, was of disproportionate magnitude. And obviously Black Death is carried by um, uh, fleas and is carried by uh, rats and other animals. And uh, from this reservoir, we had the explosion of a disease which changed the sake 
and the uh, future of Europe. Um, there are many other ones, but I would like to highlight, of course, Spanish influenza. Spanish influenza is known or was known before the COVID-19 pandemic as the greatest pandemic. Um, it killed between 50 and 100 million people. We are talking of 1918-1919. This was uh, also, it coincided with the war and uh, the First World War. And of course, um, there were um, not a lot of treatments at the time. We didn't have antibiotics. And so the virus hit very hard because this virus is an aggressive virus. But of course, the situation was, was made worse by the surrounding um, and coexisting uh, conditions. Well, this Spanish flu virus also came from animals. It came, uh, most of its genome came from an avian virus. So an influenza virus which is hosted in birds. Um, HIV is uh, uh, a pandemic that uh, affected up to now over 30 million people. It is also caused by a virus and it also emerges from uh, animals. We know that um, this virus was circulating. There are different lineages of these viruses circulating in different types of um, apes. Uh, and monkeys, and it's spilled over to uh, human beings and uh, was um, and caused, we know, all the problems that it has caused. Um, I would just like to point out, and then of course we have Ebola and we have MERS and we have swine flu that mo all people in this room have experienced, whether they know it or not. Um, but I would like to point out that uh, even in many, many years ago, over a thousand years ago, um, some of these diseases, like the plague of Justinian, created true disasters in society. So the plague of Justinian, which happened in 541, 542, uh, killed 25 to 100 million. And it is there are records of... 10,000 people dying every day in Istanbul at the time, 10 million a day. So these diseases, which come from animals, can be incredibly deadly. And so many people have, have uh, been um, approached and have started thinking about the concept of One Health. So One Health is a concept which was developed in the 60s and it uh, highlights the links between human health, animal health and environmental health. However, in um, 2020, um, this concept uh, can be expanded and should be expanded to encompass uh, more contemporary um, issues and uh, opportunities that we have. And so in 2020, The Lancet came out with this expanded version of One Health, which shows that actually there's much more to One Health than human, environmental, and animal, and, um, animal health. Um, One Health is, uh, must contain and must include uh, health systems. It must include community engagement, gender issues, equity, ethics. It must include governance. We need policy and legislation to govern uh, this uh, approach. Um, it must include funding but also knowledge integration and leadership. And I would add uh, interdisciplinary leadership because the answers are not only in the biological component of the problem. Um, the answers and the, the solutions that we are looking for lie in many other domains. Uh, for example, um, in the digital health domain. And so you will see that already before the pandemic or at the beginning of the pandemic, the human animal environmental link um, was expanded, rightly so, 
uh, to reach a more integrated approach. And that's why we need people like you who look at multidisciplinary integration of data and try to make information more accessible, even if it comes from another platform. But in 2022, um, my friend Marion Kopmans and her group came up with this uh, representation of One Health, which is more, more elaborate, but you will see also stretches into uh, other domains that were not traditionally held by the One Health community. So apart from healthcare systems and uh, population growth, you have mobility and transport because yes, epidemics and diseases are moved around by people who fly on planes. Um, also the urban environment and deforestation and people who travel in areas which are at risk for these diseases can become the index case um, for the, a spark of a new epidemic. And of course, um, there is more. There is food, there is international trade, there are farming practices. How do you farm your animals? How do you keep your animals healthy? How do you ensure that the millions and millions, billions of animals that are farmed globally are farmed in a sustainable way so that the meat or the products that are obtained from these animals are healthy? And how do we ensure that the farming of these animals does not devastate the environment more than it already has? But here, so, so you will see that thinking and looking at the One Health uh, approach has evolved very, very rapidly over the past three years. But actually, I would like to push this drawing, this, this representation even more, even more. And um, the reason for it is that there are many other things that are happening around us and we need to bring these other um, situations into the equation as well, because they're not gonna go away. So um, COVID-19, I think, uh, can be considered a multi-system st stress test. It, it, it does originate from the animal reservoir. It has uh, spread to the world like many other uh, pandemic viruses, but um, it has had a direct impact, for example, on air quality. This is uh, a picture taken from, from uh, space uh, where you see the um, NO2 concentration, and you will see that before the pandemic, the amount of NO2 which was in the air was much higher than a year later. And um, on top of this, we have seen and we have realized that um, international air transportation um, has actually, of course, it has a very a large impact on, on pollution, but we have also realized that moving the way we used to move before the pandemic all the time was actually um, something that could spread and enhance uh, the severity of the pandemic. And I think that many of us question ourselves as to should we be traveling as much as we were before? And uh, I am unsure that this is the right, uh, that saying yes is the right answer. The pandemic has transformed our social life. It has emptied many uh, cities. It has it is forcing cities to reinvent themselves. And it has also changed our, our spiritual life because you will remember that we couldn't even go to church in places of worship as we used to uh, because of the pandemic event. And then we have again rediscovered our relationship with certain animals, which can be um, a cause of, of these uh, spillover events. And finally, um, there is another thing that I would like to mention, which is a gender dimension. Such a pervasive event has affects, of course, all genders, it affects all people, and therefore it affects men and women, and it affects them in a different way. And I think that we are now at the point where we need, we must 
look at this um, better. And of course, the costs. This, uh, co this pandemic, the latest figure I could find is that it cost over $16.5 trillion, which is um, an, it's, it's a figure that's so big that we can hardly even um, keep it in our minds. But I do think that, as we say, the, uh, every cloud has a silver lining, and this cloud has a rainbow inside it. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you, and that's why I'm here, because uh, we need your help. We need the help of people like you to help us put the bits together. Why? Because we have realized that um, if we do certain things, there will be changes. In certain sectors, we have not re reached the point of non-return. Actually, um, the air quality has improved in because of the lockdown. And therefore, we do have space for improvement if we can only redesign our behaviors. And I think that we are at a societal tipping point. This is the time where we have to take some decisions because um, it, it just seems to have happened altogether. And if we don't take those decisions, um, I believe that ugly things will happen. And so what are those decisions? And, and you know, uh, advancing health, health as a system means that we should look at the big picture and we should try and co-advance the health of humans, animals, plants and the environment as one. And to do this, the first thing we need to look at is how do we position ourselves when we relate ourselves to other living beings? And we know that human beings, uh, homo sapiens, put themselves at the top of everything and uh, are often invaders rather than guardians of the system we operate in. And we need to shift. We need to understand that we are just one part of the system and that we are the ones that have more brains and therefore and more anal analytic capacity and more intellectual force. And we cannot ask the mosquito or the spider to become in change or the mushroom, but we have to take on this responsibility ourselves as homo sapiens. But there is something else that you guys know very well about, uh, which I think comes in, in our support, which is we are living and evolving we, present, which is the incredible and ever expanding um, open science movement. Because what this is doing is this is basically uh, breaking the silos between disciplines because um, anyone can have access to a great amount of information which was unthinkable uh, a few years ago and these domains are becoming transparent so uh, basically we can see through them and if you can see through them um, they are like glass and if they are like glass they can be rearranged in a way that um, they don't uh, appear in the shape of silos, but they appear in the shape of a circle and circular health is at the intersection of all these different disciplines, because every discipline has something to do with health. So this was a lot of nice words, but how do we do it? How can we optimize health within our sustainability priorities and policies? So, of course, I don't have a magic wand and I don't have a solution for everything, but I have some ideas and I will come, I will share with you three circular health ideas, um, one of the past, one of the future and one of the present. Okay, so uh, in the past, and this is ironical because this is not a problem of the past. This is a problem of the present, but it was identified in the past. It was identified between 2014 and, 20, oops, and 2015. Um, antimicrobial resistance, which is the selection of bacteria which are resistant to treatment, uh, is deemed the biggest health threat that we will have over the next um, uh, 25 to 50 years. And you will see that already in 2014, AMR was considered to be 
by 2050, the greatest cause of death, more than cancer and many other um, diseases that um, affect us. And now we are talking about 700,000 a day. Um, so we need to put a lot of attention to this because it's going to happen. And when it is going to happen in such a massive way, if we continue to use antibiotics in an unresponsible manner, um, it, it is going to be a very, very serious health problem. So what are the causes of antimicrobial resistance? These, there are many causes. The, um, we are basically using too many antibiotics in people. We are not disposing of antibiotics properly. So we are throwing them in the trash and throwing them in the toilet, which, end, which makes these molecules end up in the environment. Um, we are using them in animals and we are not managing the, the, the problem in an appropriate and way, which encompasses the complexity of antimicrobial resistance. So uh, um, a few years ago, um, uh, Jim O'Neill, who is uh, uh, a British uh, political um, uh, person, uh, took on uh, the leadership uh, of a group to review uh, what was happening with antimicrobial resistance. He did, he's an economist by training, and he came up with these 10 recommendations. And these recommendations are quite straightforward, but they need to be implemented uh, in a convergent way and in an organized way. And of course, you need to make people aware that this is a problem. You need to improve hygiene. You, you need to reduce the use of uh, necessary use of antimicrobials. You need a global plan to address this issue. You need better diagnostics. You need to use more vaccines. And there are a series of, I, I would say, activities which are very well defined. But how do you implement them? And this has been a real challenge. And what, um, what could be a, a good roadmap to implement these recommendations is to use our uh, sustainable development goal roadmap. Because if you look at those recommendations, you will see that these recommendations could be easily included among the targets of the sustainable development goals. In zero hunger, for example, where there is uh, a recommendation to um, produce better food and healthier food, you can reduce the antibiotics in agriculture. For example, you can create awareness through quality education. For example, you can produce better diagnostics and better tools through goal nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And, and so at this point, if we are able to uh, understand that we need a convergent approach, you can join, uh, we should join up forces between all the different activities which are needed for this priority and converge towards health. I mentioned earlier that there is a gender issue which um, has emerged from the pandemic. Um, and this is something that I believe pertains to the present and to the future. And um, we know that women and men have been affected uh, differently by the virus, um, not only for the biomedical uh, consequences, but also for um, the medical costs. We know that women have been um, have been cured in intensive care less than men. We know that women are more compliant with reg with regulations. We know that women can implement behaviors which are absorbed by the family, but we know that women have lost more jobs, particularly in science, by the way. And we know that women are burdened with the greatest weight of the pandemic. And so I don't think that we can pre pretend that this is not happening and that we can pretend that this pandemic is affecting men and women in the same way. So how do we do it? Well, I think it's really easy. Um, 
uh, easy peasy. Um, and it actually starts from us. It's us like a scientist that need to do something about it. We need to make sure that the data sets we look at for research uh, become disaggregated by sex and gender all the time. We need to make sure that sex and gender data are included by default in all pandemic studies. Because if we don't, we will have um, data analysis and we will have results which are not realistic for what is happening in the field. And you will know that when you work with data and you try and obtain data from companies that provide this data, very often if you are asked about um, gender data, uh, they will ask you to pay for it. And I think that this is absolutely unfair and unethical. And so I would invite all of you to push so that when you look at your data, it is um, in a shape that is will allow this distinction uh, by default. It, it's easy, but it's only the beginning because there is more, and I'm sure that you, you uh, the audience knows much better than I do the difficulties that we can encounter when we go fishing for data, because we know that data are not collected with a gender perspective. We know that there is bias. We know that the uh, there is an imbalance uh, in gender representation between coders and people who develop algorithms. And how do we solve this? Well, we need to solve this because we cannot leave half of the world out uh, or let's say uh, unattended or not looked at properly. We need to be transpa more transparent and more accountable. And we need to develop novel frameworks which will encompass uh, new ways of looking at data. Now, the... Um, the future, the future, I think, has, has lots of challenges, but uh, one of the things which emerged violently from the pandemic is the fact that, um, va of course, vaccines work. Uh, they have been able to, um, I would say, prevent a, a catastrophe even worse than the one that we experienced. But um, we know that the power of immunization has not been fully exploited. And this has determined a lot of bitterness, rightly so, around the world, around vaccine accessibility and equity. Because in 2022, we really cannot afford to leave uh, half of the world or even more than that without uh, a, a health a uh, product like a vaccine for a virus which is act act actively circulating and that can save millions of lives. But what is the problem? Well, the, 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 one of the problems, apart from, of course, capacity and ramping up, is the fact that we still need the cold chain. We still need the cold chain to ship and store vaccine. And this is a gigantic bottleneck if you look at a global problem. And so, we need to look at this as an opportunity for, for change. We need to understand the impact of not having uh, thermal stable vaccines added as, as of now and what the impact having thermal stable vaccines, so vaccines that do not require extreme or uh, I would say, or, or refrigeration, extreme low temperatures or refrigerations, uh, would have on health everywhere. Because vaccines are not used only by people. They are used by, by people who vaccinate animals that we use for food all over the world. And so this is how vaccines are transported today to remote areas. They bring them in a little thermic box and that's how the animals are vaccinated. And I honestly don't think that this is good enough because the vaccine often doesn't get to destination in the conditions where it needs to be. And we did a similar exercise, uh, taking information from Gavi, which is the Vaccine Alliance. And we tried to look at how certain recommendations, which are 
promoted by Gavi and how they, they perceive the benefits of vaccination, well, you will see that many of the benefits of vaccination will actually be promotive of the Sustainable Development Goal agenda. Um, there will be many changes, positive changes, if we are able to get those vaccines to people. Um, so availability of new generation vaccines can do an enormous amount of benefit to humans, animals. They can contribute to reducing AMR and reduce overall the burden of preventable diseases and address concerns about equity. Now, these are ideas for the future. We have to keep in mind that there is an enemy in the future. And the enemy is denialism. Uh, personally, as a, pers a virologist, I believe that denialism has, um, has, has caused more problems that the virus would have done by itself um, because it has also been a source of misinformation, disinformation, and therefore amplification of, uh, of uh, infection. So, um, especially in your field, this is something that uh, I am sure uh, you are all very much aware of, but is something that must be addressed and must be kept in the background of whatever uh, approach we have to making information on the internet available and readable by machines. So going back to my first point, um, uh, I, ha I, I wrote this book in, in, in 2019, so before the pandemic, and it was really about trying to join the dots between the information we have. Um, and then the pandemic came, and, and I would like to go back to the point that this is the most measured event in history, and therefore we have enormous amounts of data, enormous amounts of information, which must be used better. But the most important thing about how we use that information is that we use it in an interdisciplinary manner, because we know that um, there are uh, variables for our health that come from terra, which is uh, earth, um, which obviously influence what we eat. It influences wildlife and domestic animals and diseases but also from water, aqua, because there's a lot of health which is in, contained in water, in fresh water, in animals that we eat, like fish and crustaceans, and of course, diseases. But we also have to include the quality of air into our equation, and of course, the quality of fire um, in the most uh, in the broadest way possible, because apart from fi wildfires, which unfortunately are more and more common and widespread, we have global warming and climate change, which we know are a gigantic problem we need to address. And so the, um, the uh, idea behind circular health is that with the tools we have and with the measuring capacities we have, we can be able to interface um, m many uh, problems between each other and find novel interconnections that can show us a way to doing things in a better manner, just like the virus did that went completely global. And so um, my recommendation to you, which I think you don't need, but I always like this cartoon, is that we need to keep our mind open. We need to see that there are novel uh, opportunities beyond the pandemic. And we need to keep our mind open to the challenges that are coming because of the pandemic, but the challenges that are coming because uh, we inhabit this planet and over the years we have not done a very good job in keeping the planet in a balance which is sustainable. And with this, I thank you for your attention and uh, I am really hopeful that I have convinced you that there is a faint rainbow uh, behind all of these clouds that we have experienced uh, in the past 
few years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ilaria, for uh, the great and uh, very inspiring talk. Uh, I now re uh, remind the uh, conference attendees uh, that you can either use the chat for making questions or you can also raise your hand and you will be promoted to the panel role and you can uh, um, ask your question live. Um, additionally, you can also, um, okay, I see uh, Maria. Yeah, just a uh, yes. Uh, Maria, would you like to, to make your uh, question live? Maria Kitt. First, we have Aiden. Oh, sorry, I haven't seen him. Please, Aiden, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, very inspiring and poignant in the current situation being online and so forth. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were about the web. Uh, the role of the, the web during the pandemic in terms of there's lots of data sets shared, our world and data, people checking the data online every day for it to see. Uh, so there's lots of positive aspects of sharing data on the web, but also the negative aspects. You mentioned about disaggregation, for example, but at a certain level, disaggregation uh, rubs against privacy where you're starting to reveal data about individuals. And also maybe there were some instances during the pandemic of people making hasty conclusions or using preliminary data. We saw that also with Andrew Wakefield and so forth, taking preliminary data and sort of creating these uh, false narratives, let's say, around them. So there's this sort of push towards transparency, which is better for science, but somehow sometimes this creates social problems, problems in the media and so forth. So how, how, do, you, how do you see the, that uh, issue? Well, thank you for raising this question. And uh, of course, uh, the web is um, in, under many, in, under from many points of view, it is the wild west. I mean, there's lots of things that are happening there. Um, lots of things that people like myself don't even know about. Um, and we learn about um, when, for example, these conspiracy theories emerge or when there are, let's say massive outputs of information which is wrong and that can mislead people. And for example, the, um, uh, I would say the ivermectin uh, issue, I think is, is a good example of this. So ivermectin is, uh, it's a drug which is used to cure parasitic infection, which means mainly worms. And it's used particularly in veterinary medicine it is a it is a very successful drug for horse worms, and um, on the basis of a paper which was really not truly and fully substantiated by scientific data, I think it was actually even retracted in the end. Um, there was a whole discussion which took off about the use of the ivermectin to treat COVID nineteen. Um, I can tell you that in the United States, this has been a very big problem. There are many people who ended up in hospital because they used um, a, a, a drug for horses, right? So it's a paste that you give, like toothpaste, that you give to horses to get rid of their worms. And of course, um, this uh, is, it, it, it does not fix COVID, but especially because of the doses, because this is used for horses and people weigh much less than horses, um, it is extremely, uh, it, it is totally mis, mis, uh, misdosed. And so even if in some cases it can be used for in humans for parasitic infections, not for COVID, um, there have been many, many cases of toxicity, acute toxicity uh, caused by ivermectin in the United States. We're not talking about some remote country that doesn't have access to information. So yes, the web is an incredible source of information. I am um, an advocate and I have been a pioneer in data sharing on web-based platforms. Uh, many years ago, as Claudia D'Amato uh, mentioned at the beginning of the introduction, I championed a genetic uh, sequence sharing of genetic sequences so that scientists could work better together. Now, uh, 
this triggered an international awareness about this problem and several databases uh, emerged from, from this call to action. And in, in, in one of those databases, there are now 14 or 15 million sequences of SARS-CoV-2, so of the agent of COVID. So another point I would like to make is without that database, we would not have been able to develop vaccines, to develop diagnostics, to develop tools and understanding and knowledge to manage this pandemic. So as it always is, like the yin and the yang, there is a, there is a, a good part and a very useful part for scientists, which can uh, emerge from the web. And these are the data sharing platforms, which are obviously the future. Uh, however, uh, those data sharing platforms can also contain information that can be manipulated and misused. And you will hear, you will know about the debate around the gain of function experiments, these experiments that enhance the power of certain pathogens. Um, and they can, but they can also be used, of course, for the sake of good. And so my answer to your question, which of course, I don't have the right answer, but is that this is something that is a very long process and that will need to be managed and need to be governed in the future. Because if the internet creates and open access platforms create more misinformation and disinformation, even worse, um, we, we need to stop it because that can create uh, spirals of implosion and of enormous damage. So that's my, my two cents in that. Then thank you. I think education maybe of the public could help as well. It's a longer term goal, but if the public were better educated on how to interpret data, perhaps it would be ideal. Yes, that, that's also, I think, a relevant point. Uh, however, we, we have heard the word infodemic, right? And we know that the people out there have been flooded with information that they cannot even manage from, because it's so much. And so, yes, we need to educate people. Yes, we need to invite people to go in trusted sources, but this is not gonna happen overnight. And so we do need, um, I would say a significant effort from academia, from policymakers, and from scientists um, to address this issue uh, in, in a convergent form. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, uh, question is uh, from uh, Maria Kitt. Please, Maria, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the presentation and bringing to the fore this notion of the One Health view. Uh, from your perspective as more of a user of computing technologies uh, rather than from that, that you're not really that sent in the computing applications, which ones do you see as crucial uh, for in the general case for the most needed now and in the near future to be able to do basically your research say on the infectious diseases component or the functioning of the healthcare system? Would it be something like, no, it's really the focus on data integration and sharing or the fair data sets, or maybe you say, well, no, this things, artifacts like the gene ontology were the most essential to actually get ahead or finding the material data analytics, which one, whichever, maybe something else, but which of those techniques would you say was, was, yeah, it was the, the most crucial and is now most needed and what you think for in five years time, I want to have X kind of technology that really would have helped even more. Yeah, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, so I think that interfacing data and making data interoperable, at least that's what I'm interested in. I am in at, at this point in my career, you know, we know what we can do with, um, you know, gene mapping and um, um, the ontology, but there are certain ontologies and ways of accessing data which don't exist. And these, the ones that don't exist are the ones that cross the dip disciplines, are the ones that put in relation uh, the climate or the quality of the water with um, the health of the people 
uh, in the background of the pandemic. So um, I, I do think that there needs, because you can't find things, right? If, if you search data sets, um, you cannot find, if, if you put in keywords that, that bridge different areas, often you don't, you cannot find anything that's, that's have any use to you. And so we, you <laughs> have done, let's say a lot of work in a vertical approach to what you want to know and within given domains and within certain silos, um, I think that the next challenge is breaking those silos and allowing scientists to use in a constructive manner data which comes from uh, completely different disciplines. For example, we've seen um, the impact of the pandemic on mental health, right? And uh, this is something that I don't think was very much ex expected, although pandemics are known to cause regression. Um, the Spanish flu, they, they did a study in Norway because it was not in the war at the time. And they saw that there was incre an increase in mental health disorders of seven times compared to before the pandemic. And so we are just opening new windows of awareness, but the data don't really talk to each other. And it's very difficult to draw any sensible conclusion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. The, ne the next question is from uh, Carlis uh, Serans. Sorry for mispronouncing, <laughs> for mispronouncing no. your name. <laughs> Uh, hello. Uh, so thanks for your uh, your talk. Uh, uh, interesting one, and uh, I would like um, to explore uh, one particular aspect of this very important problem that you have been mentioning. So, in the semantic web community, we are concerned about the distribution of the data around the web and the knowledge, so that this data and knowledge doesn't stay in single hands. And I would uh, like to look at this in a little bit more global way. So by implementing the measures that you suggest, so Agenda 2030, Sustainable Development Goals, promotion of this One Health concept, how to ensure that there is no too much power concentrated in single hands and that the power in the world and the actual decision-making could stay distributed? Is, has this been accounted for in, in some one or other way? I would very appreciate uh, your comment. Yeah, so um, of course, if, if we zoom, this is not a general statement, this is about COVID and about how it was managed. Um, let's say that the power of the decision makers is very much linked in this case to um, how strong national experts are and how large organizations like the WHO um, manage expert groups that then um, make decisions or propose decisions. Certainly the pandemic has shown that the world is just not the West. The world is much bigger than the West. And if we don't take care of the rest of the world, we will be in great trouble. So I share your concerns. You will have seen that, for example, there are uh, epidemic preparedness and intelligence platforms that are now in Africa. And this was not the case before. And so I believe that a disseminated rather than central um, network of, of decision making and of power is the way to move forward. There are issues with how fast a disseminated network can react because a disseminated network needs to be created. I mean, there are parts here and there, but it's not fully and functional and operational for what are your needs, for example. But certainly, and vaccine equity, I think speaks for itself as such a big problem uh, that we have faced with many, many people who were mad at the West for using vaccine first and not having product for the rest of the world. I mean, the world was waiting for a pandemic. They knew that a pandemic was gonna come, but we weren't absolutely prepared to answer and to provide 
um, the whole world with product. And so this is just one of the examples um, which we have learned from. And I think it can act as a model for the future for disseminated networks that manage knowledge and then decision making. And the networks need to be interdisciplinary. They cannot be made only of scientists, because if you look at the, at the terrible debate that's going on now about gain of function and whether this, uh, this virus, well, the virus was created in the lab or was, you know, made worse in the lab, um, we need to decide what we want to do with these gain of function experiments all over the world, not only in America or in Europe or in China. We need to have a line of conduct which is not only made of scientists. It's made of ethicists, it's made of lawyers, it's made of political scientists, and it's made of economists, because these problems touch many, many areas and should be, I think, addressed by people who are experts in disciplines which influence that topic, but that have traditionally been left out. Thank you, Ilaria. Uh, we are running uh, out of time, but I would like to, to, to take the chance to ask you the very short, uh, the, the very brief uh, question. Uh, two key aspects of this community uh, are uh, data uh, interlinking and uh, assigning uh, a shared data semantics. We have done a lot of work in, within this community, but I'm pretty sure that uh, a lot of work need to be still need to be done. I would like to know how much of this is perceived in your community, because uh, as you said, it's uh, also a matter of uh, interconnecting disciplines. Uh, and uh, I would, I'm curious to know how much uh, good we have been in this direction. There are some uh, some, some, some effort with the SNOMED, for instance, just for citing uh, uh, the, the uh, one example, but uh, on a larger um, extent, and certainly you are a better observer at this regard, I would like to know how much of this, if this is actually perceived and how much usable at this state for, for the current state of the art, this is for, for your community. So, I mean, I can tell you what my experience has been. And um, we have uh, worked with trying uh, to find overlapping concepts uh, within the discourse, the international discourse of the sustainable development goals, because the sustainable development goals, you cannot advance one at a time because they you need to advance all of them. And so um, we try to see uh, in the global discourse, okay, in the policy making discourse and in the scientific discourse, how much, for example, let's say goal three, health, was connected to uh, goal six, which is water, or was connected to, for example, innovation. And what we found is that there is still a lot of, um, I would say, uh, information which is not uh, cataloged properly because you're at the beginning. I mean, there's so much it, it, stuff out there that you do get some very puzzling results. But <clears throat> on the other hand, when the results, you can filter them out and you can look at them with many different uh, glasses from different points of view, you can actually find some very, very interesting trends, I would say. And like one of the things that we found is that within the health discourse, life underwater, life on land, so it's the health of the oceans and of the waters, health of animals, of wild animals, uh, zero hunger, which is um, health of uh, domestic animals, they are not interconnected at all in the discourse. These, uh, and actually climate, are in a completely different area of the map, of the topical map that we would generate it. And so at the moment we can identify gap analysis. So why, why is it that there's no talk of health when you talk about oceans? or there's no talk of health when you talk about clean water, right? There's no overlap, 
But because you see that there's no overlap, that can be a very strong stimulus for us as scientists as to making this um, available, this knowledge available, so that research does fill in those gaps of what I call circular health, which is broader than just one health, but it's about trying to understand or, or trying to bring the concept that whatever you do has a ramification on health um, because health is so central to our survival and to the survival of our species. Thank you very much for staying uh, with us today. It has been a great Thank you. Honor. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to remind all of you that the panel is starting. In a, within two yeah, minutes. Yeah, uh, the panelists are already on standby in the next meeting. So I yeah. suggest you just, just to move on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll Thank put you. link in the chat. Bye. So. Thank you.